Thank you, Dr. Morner. Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. So uh, we will talk about uh, pain management in persons with dementia, but we will also talk about uh, what happens to pain uh, in people when we get older uh, in general, and then more specifically for people uh, with dementia, then how to assess pain in these people, and then how to manage pain uh, in people with dementia. So uh, I hope this is uh, of uh, interest to you. So uh, let's start with um, the beginning. So what's pain? Uh, pain has been defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So what's important here, there are a few words that are important. So pain is a sensory experience, of course. I think we all know that it's a sensation. But pain, especially chronic pain, is much more than a sensory experience. It's a multidimensional experience uh, with a big emotional uh, component. And, and of course, this emotion is unpleasant. The, the other part that's important is that pain is associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. This means that some people have pain and when you do a CT scan, X-rays, MRIs, you will find something abnormal uh, that's causing pain, uh, arthritis, spinal stenosis, or something like that, or uh, neuropathy if you do an EMG. But some people have chronic pain. They can have very severe pain. And if you do all tests that you could do, even if you would do an autopsy after they die, you don't find anything that's abnormal. The, the, Best example for that is fibromyalgia. These people have very severe pain, but there is nothing, there is no physical or anatomical abnormality that you can find. And this is why we think more and more of pain, especially chronic pain, as a neurological disease. So we know that pain is caused by neurotransmitter imbalance, and we know that some people are more prone to have chronic pain or, or more sensitive to acute pain because their neurological system is uh, built this way. So, so if you just remember one thing today is that pain is just more than a sensation. It's really a multidimensional experience associated with uh, emotion. So why should we talk about pain in older people? Well, the first reason is that it's very common. It's very hard to study prevalence of chronic pain uh, in the population because it depends on the population that you study. It depends on the definition of pain you use. Uh, but most studies have found that prevalence of pain in older persons living at home is somewhere between 30 and 75 percent. I'm sure you're thinking that's a very wide range. The average is usually 50 percent, which means that one out of two older person living at home has significant pain, which is usually defined as daily pain. This, this study of two years ago in the United States they ask all the people living at home what symptom they had the day before. So this was just a random sample picked up from a phone book, and they asked this question, and pain was the most commonly reported symptom. 73% of these people said they had pain the day before. When we, we look at all the people, pain in these people is most often chronic, so it's been lasting for many, many, many years. Uh, I have quite a few patients who've been in pain for 50, 60, 75 years. Some have started having pain when they were fighting in World War II, and they've been in pain since then. Some have been in pain since they were 19 years old, and they're 85 now. So pain has often been lasting for a very long time. And of course, the longest the pain has been uh, lasting, the hardest it is to treat, because it becomes part of a person's life, and it's much harder to treat, because it modifies their interaction with people, with family, it can interfere with work, with function. So it's often more uh, difficult to treat in these people. Pain in older people is also often multifactorial. If you have a, a young person with chronic pain, they usually have one reason to have pain. They had a work accident, they had a sport accident, a car accident, they have one disease that causes pain. But when you look at older people, they often have several reasons to have pain. They have spinal stenosis, they have uh, 
uh, back arthritis, they have arthritis in their joints, they have diabetic neuropathy, post diabetic neuralgia, uh, chronic headaches. So these people often have seven reasons to have pain. Something that's very interesting also, uh, just talking about pain in general, is that if we um, look at uh, CT scans or MRIs uh, of people who have um, reasons to have pain, they have spinal stenosis or arthritis, there's no correlation between the imagery and whether the person has pain or not. So with the same MRI, one would be in severe pain not walking, and the other one wouldn't have pain at all which tells us that, again, pain is much more than a sensation, and it's a neurological uh, disease, and uh, the uh, neurotransmitters are very important in pain transmission. So if we look at pain in long-term care, it's even harder to study pain in these patients because they can't report pain most of the time. But if we look at people who have reasons to have pain, either they had pain before getting demented, or uh, they have a reason to have pain, it goes up to 80% of people in long-term care who are uh, at very high risk of having pain. And we know that pain complaints are less frequent in patients with cognitive impairment. And the more demented you are, the less you report pain. And we're gonna come back to that in much greater details later. We also know that pain is undertreated in older persons. And this is true in all LTR settings. It's been studied in outpatient clinics of orthopedics, geriatrics, internal medicine, uh, family practice, geriatric wards, medicine wards, surgical wards, post-op all surgeries you could imagine, uh, ICU, palliative care. We know that pain is undertreated in these people, emergency room uh, uh, being the most important. Not that they get lower doses of medications, which is normal, but they get less medications. And the older you are, and the more demented you are, the higher the risk is of having your pain undertreated. So what happens to pain when you get older? This is an Australian study where they study pain throughout the lifespan. So we can see that pain uh, prevalence increases with age. Uh, there, that's an, an Australian study, but there is a Canadian study that has exactly the same, uh, the same uh, numbers. So, uh, and it's true for all types of pain. All types of pain get more frequent when you get older, except one, which is headache, especially for women after menopause. Women tend to have less migraines, uh, and also men, but all other types of pain get more common uh, when you get older. There seems to be a little dip here in uh, older men. Uh, I always thought this was a bias from the Australian study, but we see the same thing in the Canadian study. So this suggests that there's maybe something special about men uh, when they get past 70 that it's like what we call the survivor effect. So they have something special that they have less pain. Maybe they work less physically in their life or something. You also see that there is more pain in women than in men. This is true in all studies. I think this is a bias because uh, men, when they're in pain, they don't complain. So that's why we don't see it in the study. <laughs> so, because because we know that men never complain when they are sick. So, so it's, this is why it doesn't show in the study. They just suffer in silence. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that you're laughing, because I, I, I tell this joke like numerous times, of course. And when I teach medical students, nobody laughs. <laughs> so then I have to explain that it's a joke. <laughs> And when you have to explain it's a joke, it means it's a bad joke, right? <laughs> so, but seriously, there's a lot of reasons why women have um, more pain than men. Uh, it, it's explained by hormones uh, 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 among several things. And we also know that women have more arthritis than men. So maybe that's why they're in pain more. So what happens with pain when we get older? A uh, long time ago, people thought there was presbyalgia, which means a diffuse, non-specific decrease in pain sensation. They thought that because when we get older, there is presbyacusis, we hear less well. There is uh, presbycia, we see less well. So people thought that it was part of normal aging, that all senses work less well, so we would feel pain less when we're old compared to when we're young. So they did studies to study that. So what we do when we want to study pain sensation or pain perception is that we put the hand on the hot plate 
and we increase the temperature of the plate. And we measure three thresholds. The first one is when we feel that it's hot. That's a, the, the temperature detection threshold. Then we, when there's pain, that's the pain detection threshold. And when I can't take the pain anymore and I just remove my hand. So they do that. They did that in, small, in um, young subjects and old subjects. Young subjects are usually medical students. So I don't know who the oldest ones are, maybe retired doctors or nurses or something. So when we do that, we see that there's no big difference. The plate has to be a little warmer for people to feel pain, but it's still in the normal range. It's like the 75th percentile. So a little warmer, but still the normal range. So the, the take home message is that there is no big difference in pain perception when we get older. And of course, it's all very variable from one person to the other, because aging is very variable, as you know. And most importantly, I guess there is no clear relevance for clinical pain, because not that often that you're going to put your hand in a hot plate and see if you feel pain or not. However, there are a few uh, mechanisms that we know very well that might explain why pain sensation is different when we get older. And this is important because it has some, uh, some um, impact on how people feel pain. There are two types of fibers that transmit pain from the periphery to the brain. There are the A delta fibers. The E delta fibers transmit pain very quickly and very precisely to see where the pain is and how the pain feels. And there's the C fibers. C fibers transmit pain very slowly and uh, not specific pain. It's, it's like a very vague pain sensation. So when they did studies and it's been done in humans and in animals and we see the same thing, when they do, they block the A delta fibers in young people, their pain sensation is the same as old people. And this is what we see here. So this suggests that uh, in older people, there's kind of a natural, a normal alteration of the A delta fibers. And why this is important is that these people have to rely more on the C fibers to feel the pain. And this might explain why when we ask older people to describe their pain, they have trouble describing it. So is it when we ask, do you have pain uh, above your knee, below your knee, in front of the knee, in back of the knee, the hip, they have trouble describing it. Or does it burn? Does it... Uh, does it, um, is it a cramp? Uh, is it pins and needles? They have trouble describing that. So we often get frustrated at them because they can't describe the pain uh, as well as we would like to. Uh, but it's not their fault. And we thought maybe it was a language issue uh, when people get older. But it's not a language issue. It's because there is a block of the A delta fiber. So it helps when we get frustrated at people to think that it's not their fault. It's their uh, fiber's fault. Another one uh, is the descending inhibition. Descending inhibition is very important for pain control. And this is what, uh, what prevents us from not having pain everywhere all the time. And there, is, there are a few very good examples of that in real life. So if you have somebody who has chronic arthritis and they get surgery, after the surgery, they don't complain about the arthritis. They complain about the post-op pain because the arthritis pain uh, is kind of dampened by the, uh, the surgical pain. So what happens is when you have pain, the pain is transmitted to the brain, and this activates a lot of uh, descending inhibition circuits that will decrease the pain sensation. So if you have a very severe pain, it dampens the other pains. Uh, other examples of that is if you have pain in your knee and uh, you do a knee injection, the pain in the knee is relieved, but then you start having pain in the shoulder. Or you have pain in the hip, you do a hip replacement, and then you start having pain in the knee. So sometimes we think this is psychological, and we think these people have secondary gains, that they have to have pain somewhere. But it's also there's an explanation because of the descending inhibition. So this is why sometimes I tell my patients when they have back pain, so just to uh, uh, take a hammer and knock their head with a hammer, because it's going to relieve the back pain. <laughs> So they did studies with that. So another very interesting study to do, if you're ever interested to be subject in a study, is you put the one arm in very cold water. It's three degrees, so it's very cold water. So cold that it's painful. And at the same time, you do electric shocks on the other hand. Uh, 
or, or you do burning pain on the other hand. So what happens in normal people, in young people, uh, and same thing with young animals, is that when you do the, uh, when you have the right arm in the uh, cold water, you feel the pain less in the left arm because your right arm will activate the descending inhibition circuit that will decrease pain in the left arm. So this is what we see in young people, in young animals, in old people and in old animals, it doesn't happen. So th maybe this is why older people have more pain, that they have more diffuse pain, and that they have pain at several locations. And um, it's also uh, an explanation. We know more and more that this is probably what explains fibromyalgia, that these people have impairment in the descending inhibition system. And what's also interesting is that this is mediated by several mechanisms, but among them is noradrenaline and serotonin. So when we talk about pain treatment, if we want to treat pain in an older person, maybe uh, it's the uh, medications that will work on noradrenaline and serotonin will work better. So what happens to pain in dementia? As I said, we know that pains or pain complaints are less frequent in patients with cognitive deficits. The more demented you are, the less you complain about pain. We know that demented patients receive less analgesics than non-demented patients. That's true for acute and chronic pains. So is it because these people don't feel the pain? So they did the same studies. A demented person, a non-demented person, put their hand on the heart plate and increase the temperature. Maybe you're asking, what's the ethics of taking a demented person and putting their hand on the heart plate when they can't consent? There are a few explanations to that. Uh, first, a lot of these studies are very old studies when you could do whatever you wanted with anybody. Uh, uh, and, and also, um, I'm not sure about Ontario. I know that in Quebec we couldn't do that because in Quebec, when somebody is demented, uh, next of kin cannot consent uh, for them to be in research. But in other countries in Europe, um, you can, a next of kin can consent for a demented person to be in a study. So I always thought this was like demented women, the demented mother-in-laws, and the son-in-law consented for the, the mother-in-law to be in the study. <laughs> so, they, so they did these studies with the demented mother-in-laws, and what they saw is that uh, when you increase the temperature of the hot plate, there's no change of the pain detection threshold. So the demented person feels the pain at the same temperature as the non-demented person. In some studies, there was an increase of pain tolerance. This means that it takes longer for them to remove the hand of the hot plate. And it's not because they were too demented to remove the hand. They were not that demented. Uh, so there might be an increased pain tolerance, but uh, it's an unclear clinical significance. And uh, it's not seen through all studies, and I can tell you that it's not seen in clinical practice. A few other things that's happened with dementia. One is what I call the surprise effect. And they did a very uh, simple study for that, is that they took demented people, non-demented people, and they create anticipation of pain with the nerves coming uh, towards a person with uh, a needle. So if you see a, person, a nurse coming to you with a needle, what, you're, you, you're afraid, you're scared. If I see a nurse coming to me, even without a needle, I'm scared, but that's another thing, I guess. Uh, so when the nurse approaches with a needle, you know you're going to have pain. You're going to have a blood test or you're going to have a, uh, uh, an injection. So what happens is that when I, the nurse is coming to me, my heart rate increases and my respiratory rate increases because I know I'm going to have pain. But when the needle puncture does happen, it doesn't, and this is what we see here, when it does happen in non-demented person, it decreases. When it does happen in the demented persons, it decreases but less than the non-demented ones, and the respiratory rate doesn't increase before because I have no idea that what's going to happen, but it increases when it does happen. So because you don't get ready for pain, you don't anticipate the pain, there can be more effect of the pain. Another one is that there is no arbitration to chronic pain. The best example of that is a patient I had in um, rehab. She had a hip fracture, she was moderately demented. Every day she would wake up and say, ouch, I have pain, when she would get up. Because she didn't remember she had pain the day before, and the week before, and the month before. So for her, every day was a new pain. 
if I have pain, I know that I walk a certain way, I sit a certain way, and this is gonna relieve the pain. She couldn't do that because she didn't remember she had pain. So maybe her body remembers, but she couldn't remember. So because there's no arbitration to chronic pain, the impact can be greater. Another one is the placebo effect. We know that uh, placebo is very important for pain control. Uh, and they did studies uh, for that, that uh, if you give, uh, you, you create pain to somebody with um, electric shocks again or burns, and um, you tell them that you're going to give them morphine, but you actually give them a placebo, the pain decreases. You tell them you give them a placebo, but you give morphine, the pain doesn't decrease so much. And they even did studies that they told people they would give them something that would increase the pain, but they give morphine, and the pain increases. So placebo effect is very important. And what placebo effect is, is positive expectations. When I was a medical student, we would see placebo effect as a big uh, bad guy. So we would say if, if the person responds to a placebo, uh, it means that the pain is psychological. Now we know that it's not true. So if you think that it's gonna work, it's much more likely to work than if you don't think it's gonna work. So, and the big part of this is the relationship with the, the healthcare professionals. If there's a therapeutic alliance, it's much more likely to work. I had that uh, just yesterday. I have a patient I've been treating for a few years and very hard to treat. And she just met somebody, she's Israeli. She just met an Israeli doctor and her pain is gone, like just like that. <laughs> because she's confident that he told her he would relieve 50% of her pain and she's confident that he's gonna achieve that, even though I haven't been able for five years. So therapeutic alliance and the positive expectations is very important. A good reason, uh, I, now I'm, I'm diverting from the topic, but I'm gonna come back uh, soon. Um, a good example of the placebo effect is uh, when we give a medication, uh, and they also had studies with that. Uh, we, in geriatrics, we always start with small doses and we increase slowly to prevent side effects. But they showed that this goes against the placebo effect. And a good example of that for pain is Lyrica. We give Lyrica pregabalin, we start with a very small dose and we increase slowly. So what happens when we do that is that I give a small dose, the pain doesn't get better. So the person thinks one well, is not working. Then we increase, they still think it's not working. Increase, it's not working. So they lose confidence in the drug. So this is why some people uh, say we should start with very high doses to give lots of side effects. And people say that, patients say, well, that's a very potent drug because I'm so dizzy or I'm so sleepy, so it's a very good drug. If they don't have side effects, sometimes they think it's a too mild drug. So, what I do now, it's not been studied, but what, what I'm doing is I start with the small doses, but I tell them, don't expect it to work. It's not gonna work. We're gonna increase it, it's not gonna work, but then we're gonna increase it and then it's gonna work. So that's kind of a way to uh, counteract that. So sorry for the diversion, coming back to the dementia. So positive expectations are very important. If you're demented, Alzheimer's stage seven in a long-term care institution, you have no placebo effect whatsoever because you have no idea if the medication you're taking is for pain or cholesterol. So because you lose all your positive expectations, you lose a lot of the therapeutic effect of the medication. It's even more true in Alzheimer's uh, because placebo effect is frontotemporal. Alzheimer's is also in the same brain areas. So it's been shown that moderate Alzheimer's, they, they, they study people with an MMSC of 24, so mild to moderate Alzheimer's. They studied them again a year later, MMSC of 18, and the placebo effect had decreased quite a bit just because of that. So this is something to take into account when we treat demented people. Another thing that's not on the slide, but that we see, and it's starting to be described quite a bit in the literature, is that when people are mildly demented, especially Alzheimer's, when they, uh, uh, in, in geriatrics we say they are entering in the dementia, uh, there's a lot of anxiety related to that. So these people often complain of anxiety, they're anxious, and since pain is increased by anxiety, pain is often part of that. And they often have pain like diffuse pain that you can't treat properly. And when they get more demented, they stop complaining about that. Not because they can't report it anymore, but probably they don't feel it uh, the same, they don't feel it as much. So for these people, we won't treat them with an opiate, we'll treat them by antidepressants, anxiolytics, or treating the dementia to decrease the pain. So 
So the main challenge, however, is to assess pain in demented people, and this is what we're going to talk about now. So how should we assess pain in a demented person? Well, first, we should assess it the same way as we do in non-demented persons. So it's always better to use a self-assessment scale if we can. This means that I'm asking the person how bad the pain is. And we know that uh, from studies that patients with mild to moderate dementia can usually express the pain well enough. And a uh, minimental status exam of 18 seems to be the cutoff. So if, uh, of course, this is very viable from one person to the other. But if the minimental is higher than 18, they can usually use a self-assessment scale. Lower than 18 is harder. However, if you use different scales, and we're going to see a few uh, scales that we can use to assess pain intensity, if you use uh, up to five scales in one study, people with a minimental of 12 could do a self-assessment. 83% of them could do a self-assessment. Uh, if you use different scales. So the person who has uh, trouble seeing, you're going to use something verbal and things like that. I don't quite believe this number is 3%. I think the minimental was probably falsely low by low education in this study, because 12 is very, very low as a minimental. But this means that if we use different scales, we can usually find one that's going to be uh, good for that person. So there are quite a few scales to assess pain intensity. One of the simplest ones is a verbal descriptive scale. So we, there are f uh, several of them. So very uh, easy. Check the word that best describes your pain, most intense pain imaginable, very severe, severe, moderate, mild, slight, no pain. So people can usually uh, use this scale. And it's reliable. It's valid. So it's good to use even with people with mild to moderate dementia. Uh, of course, we could use just a, uh, three words like uh, no pain, a little pain, or a lot of pain. What we have to be careful about is that sometimes the, uh, the most intense pain is, here is unbearable. If I say that the pain is unbearable, it's not intensity. There is an emotion. Can I bear the pain or not? There is an emotion there. So we have to be careful to just keep like intensity word. Verbal numeric scale. On a scale from 0 to 10, where 0 means no pain and 10 means the worst pain possible, how would you rate your pain? This is what we usually use in clinical settings. Sometimes we use a 0 to 5, and this is also good, reliable, and valid in older people and also those with mild to moderate dementia. So people sometimes say this is subjective. A 10 for somebody is a 5 or an 8 for another one. Um, when we have people in pain clinics, they're often 500 out of 10 or 250 out of 10. Uh, because they have very severe pain. But the goal is not to, to uh, compare one to the other. It's compare one person to the same person. So if I have somebody who's 500 out of 10 and I take it down to 250 out of 10, it's a big accomplishment. And uh, we often ask people, we often tell them that they often ask what the 10 would be. Usually 10 is the most intense pain you can imagine. So for women, we usually say it's a childbearing pain. So uh, for men, it's harder. Uh, the, uh, they did a study, again, um, to, um, uh, the, am I going to say that or not? Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so for men, the most intense pain, the most severe pain is to uh, being kicked where you can think. I'm sure that all men in the room know what I'm talking about. So there is a study of men being kicked in, in the scrotum uh, compared to women uh, who are childbearing. Uh, so which one is the worst? And the worst pain is actually the man's pain who's being kicked because of the emotions. Because when you give birth, there's a positive emotion. When you're being kicked, there's no positive emotion. So. So my, 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 I have four kids, and I, when I, my, my wife was uh, giving birth, I tried to convince her not to get an epidural, because she would just screw up her pain scale, <laughs> because she wouldn't know what the 10 would be. <laughs> but she, she didn't like the idea for some reason. Another one is the uh, Iowa pain thermometer scale. So uh, it's just the same thing, uh, 0 to 10, or the, the numbers where you have a thermometer. So because you have colors, maybe it's easier for people to understand. There's one scale that's called the visual analog scale. So you have just a line 
uh, no pain, worst pain you can imagine, and you ask the person to put an X on the line where it best describes the pain. This is used in research. It's the gold standard because it's a continuous line. You have an infinite number of possibilities. Uh, it's not good for old people at all. We should never use it uh, for old people, especially those with dementia. First, we don't need the pain assessment to be that precise. And also, uh, when we get older, uh, there is a trouble with abstraction. So some people don't understand what this line means. Uh, some people have visual impairment. So they, they see the line like this, rather than just seeing a straight line. And the most important reason is that it's part of normal aging to have a decrease of uh, fine motor abilities. So maybe I want to put the X here, but it, it goes there. Real life, it doesn't change anything, but it can have a difference of two out of 10. So this one is not a good one to use. The faces pain scale is sometimes suggested for older people. Why is suggested? Because it was developed for children. People think children, old people, same thing. So we should just use the same scale. So, uh, and they said we should use it maybe even more for demented persons because uh, you can't use words, you can't use uh, numbers, but you can use faces. Not true. Uh, first, uh, this is the new form of the scale. The, the one we used to use, the one that's used with children, the one that doesn't have pain, the zero, is smiling. And the one that has severe pain is crying. Maybe it's true when you're five, but when you're 85, maybe uh, you have pain, but you're not crying. Or maybe you don't have pain, but you're not smiling because your kids don't visit you enough. Uh, but it's not because you're in pain. So that's why they came up with this one with very small differences in the face. Uh, there are a few studies suggesting that maybe it's reliable, but again, when you get demented, it's hard to uh, understand exactly what these faces mean. So not the best one to use either. So now, people who can't express pain, what are we gonna do with these people? So what we have to do is uh, observe their behavior, so nonverbal indicators of pain. And the American Geographic Society came up with this, uh, this list. So facial expressions, all you can think of that could um, uh, uh, show pain, slight frowns, sad, frightened face, grimacing, wrinkled forehead, closed or tightened eyes, rapid blinking. Uh, Morning, groaning, grunting, chanting. Somebody was asking me, "Was this is here cling out? It's the typo. It's crying out." Uh, noisy breathing, verbally abusive. So these are all signs of pain. Could be signs of pain. Body movements, changes in interpersonal interactions. What's very important here is the word changes, because maybe somebody who's usually agitated, uh, somebody who's usually quiet and gets agitated. Maybe it's because he's in pain. But somebody who's usually agitated and gets very quiet, maybe it's because it's, it's, there's too much pain when he gets agitated. So it's, gonna, it's not going to move anymore. Somebody uh, who's usually quiet and starts uh, wandering, maybe it's because of pain and agitation. But somebody who's usually wandering and stays quiet, maybe there's too much pain when he walks. So all these changes could be uh, signs of pain. Now, are we going to treat the pain and then the person gets more agitated and we get to treat the agitation? I guess that's another problem. So just to make this more formal or more objective, there is an infinite number of scales that have been developed. And this is just a very, a very um, um, limited uh, summary of the ones that exist. There are more than 50 scales that exist. Somebody at some point wrote an editorial and said, well, stop developing new scales. We have enough uh, just to study these scales. So the ones that have more evidence are the Abbey Pain Scale, Dollar Plus, the No Pain, the Pack Slack, and the Pain Add, and we're going to talk more about these. The Abbey Pain Scale was developed in Australia, so it's been recommended by all Australian uh, societies. It's fairly uh, easy to use. You just uh, and so a few questions about, uh, all these cases are based on the behaviors that we saw. Uh, vocalization, facial expression changes in body language, behavioral change, physiological change, physical changes. And you, so you score these, it gives you a score. There is no definite score that says like above X, there's pain, and below X, there is no pain. It just gives you a score that you can follow with time. 
the dollar plus, the dollar plus was developed in France. So in French, it's been translated in five, at least five languages. Uh, it, it has good uh, reliability. Uh, it's been recommended by several people to you. So again, somatic complaints, protective body postures, protection of sore areas, expression, sleep patterns, um, uh, pain with movement, psychosocial reactions. So this scale uh, usually is done um, in an interdisciplinary meeting. So it's, it's meant to be like, studied over time. It's not something that you do at uh, a specific time. So this one is usually a good one to use. The no pain scale, uh, the good thing about this one is that uh, you study pain with movement. There are several situations that we often see in uh, routine care of patients with dementia. So when you put them to bed, when you turn them in bed, so you will study pain in all these different uh, movements or uh, activities to see if there is pain. Oh, should I be scared about that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> We don't get that in Quebec. <laughs> uh, is it only when you have people from Quebec coming? Yes, you have that. <laughs> uh, pain ad is just another one, uh, very easy to use, just a few questions. It's recommended by the National Nursing Home Pain Collaboration Initiative. Paxlac is probably the one that's the most commonly recommended. It's been developed in Regina. Uh, there is also a French version. Uh, there are lots of studies showing that it's reliable, that it can discriminate between pain and no pain situations. Um, this one, you can go to the patient bedside with a board and you just click, just check whatever they have. And they usually say that if you have more than four, there's a risk that, you're, that the patient's in pain. So people, the, the, most, the one we see the most commonly are the Dolopus and the Paxlac, and these are like two religions. Like you believe in one and you don't believe in the other one. And you can't understand why people would use the other one. That's kind of how people work uh, and do it. It's two different groups that uh, study and use this. So people who don't believe in the Paxlac say, were saying that it's too long. Uh, people who did that said that it takes, I think, five minutes to do, but uh, some people say it's too long. So that's why they came up with a shorter one, the Paxlac 2. The first one has 61 questions, this one has 31 questions, and it's been shown to be as reliable as a longer version. So this could be a good one to use. There's only one that studies uh, acute pain, so people who did the Doloplus came up with the Algoplus, which is uh, to study acute pain. It's also been uh, kind of validated. Uh, you look at facial expressions, look complaints, body positions, and atypical behaviors, and you can score these and see if there is pain or not. I think that the two take home messages for that is you use the scale that you like, you use the scale that's, real, that's useful for you, and uh, you keep the same one so that people get used to it. But maybe in real life, we don't often have to use these scales as long as we know what's behind it and what behaviors we have to look for. Okay, I'll try to be a little faster. So this is just a summary of, of how we should assess pain in older people. Uh, intensity, emotional status, situational or contextual variables, functional status, so, yeah. An algorithm on how to, to, uh, to assess pain in demented people. We're gonna go over it very quickly. So can the person communicate successfully? Yes, we ask them, do you have pain? Yes assess with the pain intensity scale and treat the pain. If the person cannot communicate, then we will observe behavior. If there is evidence of a morbidity causing pain, if there is uh, a myocardial infarction, there is an appendicitis, there is a diverticulitis, there is a pneumonia, there is a bit sore, then of course we're going to treat the cause. If we treat the cause and the pain is still there, then we're going to attempt to uh, interpret other uh, behaviors, ensure that basic comfort needs are met, that the patient's not hungry, is not thirsty. And then, if we still see pain behaviors, we could treat the pain. And there are a few studies that have taken patients who were demented and agitated, and they treat the pain uh, with analgesic, Tylenol, or opioids, and we can decrease the uh, aggressivity, the agitation in these patients. We did not mention pain, they were just agitated, 
and we can decrease the agitation by treating the pain because the agitation could be a sign of pain. So as I said, pain is much more than um, a sensation. This is what I call the geriatric pain model uh, because if we want to assess pain uh, um, efficiently in a person with pain, especially an older person, we have to assess several things. We know that pain decreases functional status. We know that pain can cause depression, can uh, increase anxiety. There's a lot of studies trying to see is it depression that increases, that increases pain or is it pain that causes depression? And studies go both ways. And somebody at some point wrote a very nice editorial where he says stop studying it and treat it. Meaning that if you have somebody who's in pain and is depressed, you have to treat both so that uh, you can uh, improve, improve the pain and the depression. So we should also make sure these people sleep well, because if you don't sleep well, you have more pain. Pain believes. What the, does the person think about pain? Some older people uh, think that you, have, uh, you can't treat pain because you're going to get confused, you're going to get addicted to pain medications. Uh, it's normal to have pain when you get older. You have to suffer before you go to heaven. So these are all beliefs that we see. It's, for the, the last one, it's hard because we don't have randomized studies. One suffers, the other one doesn't. Who goes to heaven? We don't have studies for that. Uh, but we don't have evidence that it's true, so I think there is no reason to suffer. Uh, of course, not I think, I know that there is no reason to suffer. And coping strategies. It's much better when, uh, when, you get, uh, when you're in pain to use active strategies. So to go have, take a walk, to go um, to uh, relax, to uh, do yoga, to do tai chi, to do something, than to take a medication. And older persons tend to be passive. So they come to the clinic and they want you to relieve the pain. They give you the pain and they want you to relieve the pain. So, and so this is what we have to change. So every time we treat the pain, this is the goal we should have in mind. So even if we do physiotherapy, some people do physiotherapy, they have massage, they have tents, they have all these things, but then they go home and the pain is just as bad after they're back home. So we have to teach them strategies that can, they can use at home. So this is what we should do uh, if we want to treat pain. And I'm going to go quickly on this. Um, well, just one word on this. If we want to treat pain well, we should use different strategies. So non-pharmacologic, psychological, uh, physiotherapy, medications. Interventions like epidural, facet blocks, knee injections. Sometimes people think that it's, it's too aggressive to do an epidural when you're 95. But I think the other way, because if you do an injection and the pain goes away, it's much less aggressive than taking medications every day with side effects. So age should not be an obstacle to think about these things. And specific would be treating the pain. Let's skip this, skip this. I just had to show this because uh, where I work, we started a chair yoga program uh, where people in pain, and some have very, very bad pain, and they can't walk, so they do chair yoga, uh, exercises, relaxation, and what we've seen is, is, is remarkable. I was very surprised at how, uh, how successful this was, even for people with uh, uh, pretty bad pain and sometimes can live deficits. I skip this. Well, just one word on medications, and it's very easy to treat pain in older people because you just give a very high dose of medications and they're comatose and they don't have pain. So we ha always have to, uh, to assess the balance between analgesia and side effects. And this, the patient can tell us. Sometimes they ask, should I increase the dose? But I always answer, you know. Sometimes they say, I'd rather be more constipated but have less pain, or, but I know I'm too constipated. I want to have more pain and be less constipated. And we can adapt that with time, depending on their goals and objectives. Skip this, skip this. Just to say that it's always better to have an interdisciplinary team so all these people can have a role in pain management in older people. And of course, the patient and the family should be at the center. They're the ones setting the objectives and the goals. Uh, when I present this to multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary people, there's always somebody who says, you forgot my profession there, and I could also have a role. Uh, but there is no space in my slide anymore, and there is no budget, so I have to stop there. The last one was a clown, and I said, yeah, of course clown could be very useful, but I had to remove somebody and replace him with a clown, and I didn't know who I should remove, so, so I left the clown out. 
So just uh, uh, to summarize, we should adapt the treatment to the patient. Uh, no two older people are the same, so we have to adapt to their goals, their objectives, their life size. And lastly, we have to build on the patient's strengths, and I think this is a very good example. This is the, uh, this is the World Masters record team. <coughs> they, they won that in, uh, I think, 2012. It's an Australian team, so you see the ages of the swimmers here. So it's nowhere near an Olympic record. But, uh, uh, so we see here Clar Clarice Artis, who's 97. So we see here, we see her here. So when we see her here, we think it's just an old lady with a walker but this is her jumping in the water. So if you think of her as an old lady, that you're not gonna help her. You have to think of her and build on her strengths, which would be for her the swimming, or for somebody else it would be uh, something else. Thank you.